Thank you, Senator. We're very excited that this year's Values Voter Summit coincides with the release of the new film, Monumental, featuring Kirk Cameron. Well, tonight, here in this very ballroom at 9.30, we'll be giving a special screening for everyone. We'd like you to now take a, just a moment to look at the monitors for uh, a preview of this movie tonight. A set of ideas that is being implemented and advanced in this capital at this time is terribly frightening to people who are students of history. at the Roman Empire, the parallels to what is going on in America are absolutely frightening. And the question is, are we going to go the right path ourselves, or are we going to continue down the wrong path that so many nations have fallen into? And that'll be tonight at 9.30, right here in the ballroom. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome actor-producer Kirk Cameron. Well, good morning. It is uh, so inspiring, it is so exciting to be here this morning and to be part of the Values Voter Summit. I'm, I'm deeply honored and privileged to be here with you, to be part of this historic event, and to be a part of this, uh, this great uh, movement that is sweeping our nation right now. And we're so excited and we're so hopeful. And I was asked to come and be a part of this this morning, I think in part because of a brand new film that I recently produced called Monumental, In Search of America's National Treasure. And, and it was a very unique project for me personally to be involved in because I didn't approach this film as an actor. Uh, I didn't approach it as uh, a politician, I approached this as a father. I uh, am a father of six children together with my wife, Chelsea, and, and I'm deeply concerned about the world that they're walking into. L let me back up just a little bit. I did not grow up in a, a family of faith. I didn't grow up in a politically active home. Uh, today, as an adult, I, uh, I refer to myself as a recovering atheist. I lost my faith in atheism uh, a long time ago, and I now love God, and I'm so thankful and grateful to God for who He is and what He's done in my life. And although we never talked about the importance of voting for our leaders in this country locally and nationally, I now understand as a dad that someone's going to be steering the ship, that, that there are leaders that are critically important to the future and the blessing of the land that we live in. And not just for me, but now as a father, I'm looking at the fruit that's hanging on uh, the, the, the branches of our life. That's our children. They are our ultimate fruit. And they, if they're healthy, will produce seed and fruit themselves. And we want them to be in a land that is blessed as well. And so that's really the fuel that's rocketing me forward to want to do something 
and be involved in this arena that uh, you all understand is so very critical and important, particularly in this election year at this time in history for our country and for the world. And so as a father, I'm looking around, seeing that the writing's on the wall, all signs are saying panic. Economically, our nation is $16 trillion in debt. Morally, the very fabric of the nation appears to be crumbling with families falling apart, so much that is just out to, to uh, erode the family, uh, divorce and, and uh, drugs and alcoholism. We see teenage suicide. We see so many uh, unwanted pregnancies and so many things going on. We also see that spiritually, uh, it's frightening what's happening in our nation and around the world. And so as a dad, I'm wondering, what can I do about this? What can we do about this? So I turn on the news. <laughs> and I find that most people are playing the blame game. Most people uh, are, are, are getting rather vocal about all the wrong things other people are doing. And so I find the, the, the left blames the right, and the right blames the left. The rich blame the poor, and the poor blaming the rich. Uh, government is blaming big business, and big business is blaming government. And the church is blaming Hollywood, and the media is blaming religion for all of the ills of the world. And with all of this blaming going on, I'm finding it difficult to hear a clear voice that's going to take us out of this mess. Who will lead us out of this wilderness to the place of blessing? And I thought, maybe I'm, maybe I'm missing the obvious. Maybe it's simpler than all of this. Could it be that we've simply forgotten what made us such a great nation in the first place? I thought, if, if, if only I could go back in time and simply talk to the brave men and women who were there at the founding, who were there, our forefathers. If only my name was Marty McFly and I had a DeLorean. <laughs> and, and I could go back and talk to them and ask them, what are we doing wrong? What are the essentials, the non-negotiables? What, what do we need to change in order to move forward with blessing and strength? How do we return to the most free and prosperous, secure and blessed nation the world has ever known? They could tell us. Well, my name's not Marty McFly. I, did, I don't have a time machine, so I did the next best thing. I got on a plane, and I went to England, and I began retracing the escape route of the pilgrims. Before they were called pilgrims, they were the separatists. To understand who they were and why they did what they did, what was the fuel driving them to risk everything against all odds and then lay down their lives for the sake of their children. And how did they build this? And so I followed them out of England into the dungeons and the castles that they were thrown into, their underground secret worship meeting places, and then made a strategic retreat out of England to Holland. And they stayed there first for 12 years under the care of their loving pastor, John Robinson. And John Robinson is, is affectionately known as the founding father of the forefathers. And he taught them all of the nation-building principles that the pilgrims then brought with them on the Mayflower across the ocean to the New World. And they began running those plays. And they began implementing the very things that America has become famous for electing your own officials and leaders in government, a limited government, a free enterprise system, these were the kinds of values and these were the kinds of essential principles that inspired later generations with our founding fathers and beyond, and, and just put so much power in the churches and in the communities. And they built a nation because of their sacrifice from the ground up and the inside out. And it started in the heart. And, and I wondered 
why I was never taught these things in school. I, I was taught that our, our, our founders were a bunch of atheists, agnostics, and deists, and that all these great ideas came from ancient Rome and Greece. And then when I did the research myself and began examining the original source documents, like Bradford's journal um, of Plymouth Plantation and others, the very sources where we learn about these amazing people, I found that they learned these things from a very different source. And at the very heart of the treasure that made America so unique were the very eternal principles that had not been tested and tried from the ground up for 3,000 years since the ancient Hebrew Republic under Moses. And they were doing something utterly unique in the history of the world. And we today are the beneficiaries of their labors and their sacrifices. And I, for one, am extremely grateful. I know that you are too. And my hope was that in the year 2012, that we would be able to look back and maybe, just maybe, they had enough foresight to know that we would get off track as a nation. That they would know coming out of England where their economy was, was collapsing, where their king had tripled the debt, when he had enslaved the people and in essence declared himself to be God on earth, the darkness was just closing in on them culturally, economically, socially, politically. And, and they didn't tuck their head between their knees and just say, well, it's all over. Let's just get ready for the end. They said, no, no, let's get off the defense, get on the offense, make a 500-year plan, and go build a new nation. <laughs> but knowing that the human heart is, is ultimately bent toward serving itself, and prone to things like greed and pride, perhaps they would have had the foresight to put some, some guardrails in place. Perhaps they would have left us a reset button so that if we ever got off track, we could return to original factory settings. <laughs> that was my hope. And I looked, and I looked for it, and I found it, and they left it for us. And they left it in the form of the largest solid granite monument in the United States of America, and most people have never heard of it. I had never heard of it before I made this movie, Monumental. And it's sitting on top of a hill in Massachusetts. It is 180 tons of granite, making it the largest solid granite monument in the United States of America, and it lays out our forefathers' strategy for how to build and sustain a free and just society. It's called the Monument to the Forefathers, and it is now hidden behind a forest of trees in a residential area. You wouldn't know it's there unless you stumbled into it, or you were going there specifically to see it. It stands there today. And I, and I must explain this monument to you. It is utterly fascinating. She is 81 feet tall. Her name is Faith. She stands tall with her finger pointed to heaven, the God of heaven, with a star on her forehead representing wisdom. And in her left hand, she holds the word of God. It is specifically the Geneva Bible which is the Bible the pilgrims brought across with them on the Mayflower. This is the Bible that predates the King James Bible. They brought that with them and they believed, our forefathers believed, that you must have faith in the true God of heaven and in his word. And his word would give you wisdom to know how to live and to govern your society in a way that would be a blessing to all. And her foot is set up on top of a giant rock, which is Plymouth Rock. She is standing on a platform that is supported underneath her by four smaller statues. Because our forefathers believed that faith was at the top, faith in God and in his word, and it would be expressed, if it was genuine faith, in these four ways. Firstly, 
it would be expressed through an internal transformation of the heart represented by morality. And morality is there, etched in, in granite, sitting on a chair. And in her right hand, she is holding the Ten Commandments. In her left hand, she is holding the scroll of Revelation. To her right is inscribed in the granite, prophet. And there is Moses there holding the Ten Commandments to her right. And to her left is inscribed the word evangelist. And there is one of the evangelists penning the gospel to her left. So in our forefathers' understanding, faith first expresses itself not as an external standard of morality imposed upon the people, but rather an internal change of the heart that is produced by the power of the gospel. And then you have the standard of the commandments, the eternal rules of right, that then form your morality so that you know what is good and what is evil and you don't confuse the two. If the morality is put in place, they believe then that would naturally flow to a right understanding of which laws to pass. And law is the second statue under the second corner of the platform she's standing on. And these laws are just and merciful laws. And there is the man of law sitting there with the law books in his hand. His hand is outstretched in mercy. And to his right is justice. And Lady Justice is there. She has a sword in one hand and the scales in the other hand so that there would be fairness and, fairness and justice in the laws so that the, that the punishment would fit the crime. And to his left is mercy. And under law and, the, and the, laws of book, the books of laws that he's holding is faith who is holding the book of books. And so the laws that, that the forefathers would make would never be in violation of the eternal rules of right. You would never pass a law of murdering someone else. You would not pass laws that would amount to stealing someone else's property because these would be an, an infraction and a violation of the ultimate laws that would produce blessing for the land. Now that you had civility in your society through laws that were based on a right morality, you could then educate your children. And it was imperative to them that you did because you had to educate your children and your children's children to pass your values on to future generations or they would be lost. And education is a woman uh, sitting here in her chair with a wreath of victory around her, her head. She's holding books of knowledge and to her right is a young mother instructing her child in the way that he or she should go. And the child is there copying down the things he's learning from his mother. And on her left is wisdom depicted by an older man with a long gray beard, and he is holding a Bible in one hand and a globe in the other hand, representing the belief that if you train up your child in the way he should go, when he is old, he will be wise and not depart from it. And then fourthly, the culmination, the result, the reward of following this strategy, this matrix of liberty, was Liberty, and Liberty Man is seated in his chair, and he has the, the, the armor still on his, his body. His sword is tucked back in its sheath. He is at rest, and the chains on his wrists and on his hands have been broken, and there is a lion head that is draped over his shoulder, and the hide of this lion of tyranny has been uh, slung over his back. And he has been defeated. Amen. To his right is the picture of Liberty Man with his foot on the, the, the chest of tyranny, having overthrown him. And to his left is his wife. Her name is Peace. And she is holding uh, a cornucopia that is a bounty and an overflow of blessing and uh, good things for her family and her community. This is the strategy for producing liberty in our country as given to us by our forefathers. It's what they believed. We know that, and it's how they lived. 
I find it interesting that today one of our political parties is wondering whether to keep the name God in the platform, while according to our forefathers, God is the platform. I said earlier that I made this film monumental uh, in search of America's national treasure, uh, which uh, uh, in fact will be uh, available for you who are interested to see tonight at 9.30 p.m. in the theater. I did this for the sake of my children. And I didn't do it for my children alone, but also for your children, and for your children's children, and for their children. And my kids and your kids are the fuel that drive me to be passionate about another issue, and that is the sanctity of life. While some people, while some people are, are, are able to look at this issue of the sacredness of a heartbeat in the womb as, as perhaps a political issue or as perhaps a worldview or an ideological or philosoph philosophical issue, for me it's a family thing. You see, I have six children. Four of my children are adopted. My wife is also an adopted child. If it weren't for the young lady that chose to give my wife the gift of life, my two natural born children would not be here either. My whole family is here today because of the gift of life and adoption. And I believe that adoption is the answer to the abortion crisis. We change only two letters in the word abortion and we get the word adoption and it reflects the heartbeat of God. And so I want to thank all of you for all of your tireless efforts and your hard work of loving and caring for young ladies who find themselves in a difficult and desperate situation with a pregnancy that they don't know quite how to handle. And you've taken the time to tell them the truth about the, the heartbeat that is in her womb and that there is a young child who is waiting for its, its first breath its first birthday, its first step, its first day of school, his or her marriage, his or her first child. And you're walking her through that process and showing her genuine love and hope. And you've provided blessings for millions of people as a result. And I, for one, am a recipient of that hard work, the blessing of that work, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful for you. Thank you. Will you please pledge with me to continue to pray for our nation and for the election coming up in November. Make sure that you are prepared by registering to vote and helping your friends and family to make sure they are pre uh, prepared to and registered to vote and then go out on election day and vote your conscience and your values. They are critical. Thank you very much, and God bless you.